Okay, today we're going to talk about chapter five. Chapter five is the integument and related structures and talk about uh, all the different, a lot of different species that we deal with, uh, not necessarily covering exotics. We will cover that later on in our semester. Let's begin with our learning objectives. So first we have to list the cell types that make up the epidermis and describe the function of each of those cell types. We're gonna be talking about the five layers of the epidermis and there are different cell types that are in those epidermis that all have different functions. We're gonna describe the process of keratinization and list the structures that constitute the dermis, which is below the epidermis, and describe the function of those. And also list the structures of the hypodermis, which are fortunately far less than, than the structures that are within the other uh, two layers. We're gonna describe the unique features of the paw pads and the planum nasal on animals. We're gonna describe the parts of the hair follicle and explain how hair grows. We'll list and describe the three types of hair. And we're gonna describe the structure and location of sebaceous glands. We'll also differentiate between eccrine and apocrine sweat glands because I know that you are dying to understand that. So skin and related structures, what does that mean? Well, skin, obviously, but also hair, hooves, horns, claws, and skin-related glands. The functions of skin are to prevent desiccation. What is desiccation? Desiccation is drying out. Think about a grape. A grape turns into a raisin. A grape turns into a raisin because the membrane around the grape allows water to escape. As water escapes, that grape becomes smaller, shrunken, and wrinkled. Uh, and that's what would happen to us if our skin lost the ability to keep the water in uh, and to keep bad things out. So keeping bad things out, it reduces the threat of injury. Any break that we have in our skin indicates that we have a break in, in our barrier. And uh, so we could have uh, bacteria or uh, fungus or other things um, injure our body. It also assists in maintaining normal body temperature it helps to excrete water, salt, and organic waste. Just think about sweat. Um, it receives and conveys sensory information. You touch your skin, you know that you can feel that. You know where your skin is in relation to things that are hot, uh, things that are cold. And it also, pretty coolly, uh, does this. It synthesizes vitamin B and it stores nutrients. So it's kind of like the leaves of a tree um, uh, performing photosynthesis for that tree and uh, gathering in the sunshine. Our skin also does that. It gathers in the sunshine, um, makes vitamin D from that ultraviolet light, and then that vitamin D helps to mobilize our calcium so that we can have uh, good calcium deposits throughout our body in the right places. All right, so skin, integument. It consists of three layers. Those three layers are the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. I'll say that again, epidermis, very top layer, you touch it. The dermis, which is just underneath the epidermis, and the hypodermis, which is in between really what you feel as skin and the rest of the tissue in the body. We're gonna talk about what each of those different layers do and what's in them. The epidermis has a couple of different cell types. It has keratinocytes. Keratinocytes are cells that produce keratin. That's the tough, fibrous, waterproof protein that gives skin its resiliency and its strength. Now, keratin is found in your skin. It's also found in your nails. It's found in your hair. So it is found in all of these different cells. Melanocytes are the cells that produce the melanin pigment. All skin, with the exception of uh, people or animals that have albinism, produce a melanin pigment. Now, it's the way that melanin pigment is located within that melanocyte that gives the skin the color that it is. We'll go over that in a minute. Merkel cells are sensory receptor cells that transmit signals through synaptic contacts with somatosensory neurons. So basically, they are, are specially adapted cells in your skin that help to transmit nervous signals. Langerhan cells are part of the immune system. They're found in the stratum spinosum, which is a layer of the epidermis, and they're, they're thought to be involved in allergic and cell-mediated immune response within the skin. They're, they're considered the macrophages of the skin. So remember what a macrophage is. A macrophage is a tissue-based monocyte. A monocyte is one of the white blood cells that goes around and eats um, bacteria and foreign cells. 
the longer Han cell is the same thing, but it's located within the cell or in the skin. And it's uh, part of the epidermis. So great big picture coming up showing you a melanocyte and some keratinocytes within the epidermis. So epidermal layers, there are um, five different possible layers. Now, not all of these layers are present throughout the skin, but there are five layers in the thickest part of the skin. So we're going to talk about all five of them and tell you which ones, which parts are, have all five layers and which mostly have three layers. The first layer, which is at the base of the epidermis, where it comes in contact with the dermis, is the stratum germinativum, which um, to make things easier for me and for you, I'm just going to call it the basal layer or the stratum basal. It is the deepest layer and it consists of a single row of keratocytes, which are attached to an epithelial basement membrane. So that basement membrane, think of it as the slab of your house, or it is the uh, slab, uh, the, the ground floor, the floor of your basement, okay? So that is that is a, a single row of keratocytes or those cells that, that produce keratin attached to that very bottom floor of the epidermis. There are also Merkel cells. Remember, Merkel cells are the t um, sens sensory cells, melanocytes, and keratocytes. They're all in that layer. The stratum spinosum is the next layer up. It's a spiny layer, and there are several layers of cells in this layer that are held together by desmosomes. The desmosomes are uh, simply attachments between cells. Um, the longer Han cells, remember those are the macrophages, they are found in this layer. So we talked about the first layer, keratinocytes, uh, we have um, Merkel cells and melanocytes, and the next layer up we have the longer Han cells uh, as, as well as the keratinocytes. The stratum granulosum is the granular middle layer. It's composed of two to four layers of flattened diamond-shaped keratocytes that contain lem lemylated granules of glycolipids. It's these glycolipids that help to provide uh, waterproofing of the skin. It slows the water loss across that epidermis. Now, the stratum granulosum is one of those layers or strata that are not, um, not in all um, parts of the body. Um, this one and the next one are, are, are two of the layers that are missing in the thinner parts of the epidermis. But the stratum granulosum, if you can remember, we have these uh, keratocytes with glycolipids, and that it's those glycolipids that help with the waterproofing. In the stratum lucidum, which is the clear layer, this is found in very thick skin, it's composed of a few rows of flattened dead cells. The contents of the keratogranules are combined with intracellular tonofilaments to form keratin fibrils. So this is just one more layer of um, keratocytes, kind of dead skin, um, that is found in between the granulosum and the very top layer of the epidermis, which is the stratum corneum. This is the horny outermost layer. It's composed of 20 to 30 rows of keratocyte remnants. So not only are these dead cells, but they are pieces of dead cells. These are also called horny or cornified cells. Now, the, the farther they're pushed up to the surface, the, the more uh, parts you find of them, and the, the really the deader, I don't know how you can get deader, but the deader they are, uh, and, and until eventually they actually um, come off the outer layer of your skin. We are constantly shedding pieces of our skin every single day. Um, and uh, if you were to look at this as a drawing, in this lower left corner, you can actually see the flakes of keratinized dead cells um, in the stratum corneum. Um, down here, the stratum lucidum, we've got the glycolipids that make the skin care, um, waterproof. And down here, we have the stratum granulosum, and then we have the stratum spinosum and the stratum basal. The epidermis of hairy skin, These, this is the skin that mostly covers your body. If you look at any mammal, you will see that uh, mammals who have hairy skin do not have hair in certain areas. These include the palms of our hands and the bottoms of our feet, and then usually around our lips a little bit, uh, but that's about it. That's, that's We have hair covering every other part of our body. 
Um, a hairy skin usually consists of three epidermal layers rather than five. So the, remember what I said, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, they're gone. We just have the stratum basal, stratum spinosum, and stratum corneum. The surface of the hair, hairy skin is covered in scale-like folds. And you look at this picture here, you can kind of see that we have little folds of the skin. There is a knob-like elevation every once in a while. We call that a papilla. It's a tactile elevation. Usually it has a little hair coming out of it. We call that the tactile hair or tylotric hairs. These are hairs that are connected with nerve endings that allow us to, some feeling if we just touch um, along our skin, but just above our skin, we can feel the hair on our skin. Um, and uh, it's those tylotric ha hairs or the tactile hairs that give us that sensation. So we finish with the epidermis. We have five layers, several different sh cells. Um, remember to go through those uh, again in your, in your head and, and repeat them over and over. That will help you to remember that. We're gonna build on that now. We're gonna go to the dermis. The dermis is composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. Dense, irregular connective tissue. Collagen, elastic, and reticular fibers are all in the dermis. The dermis also includes hair follicles, nerve endings, glands, smooth muscle, blood vessels, and lymphatics. Fibroblasts, adipocytes, and macrophages are also present. So there's a lot going on in the dermis. There are two layers of the dermis that are held together. The, the papillary layer is the upper layer that connects with the epidermis. If you look at this picture, you will see that these lock together kind of like Legos. So the papillary dermis has projections that come up and the epidermis has sockets in which those projections come up. And so that holds the epidermis tightly to the dermis. The, so the papillary layer just right underneath the epithelium, it's composed of loose connective tissue with, um, with loosely woven fibers and a ground substance. So there's dermal papilla that cements the epidermis to the dermis. There are blood vessels, pain, uh, temperature, and touch receptors in that dermal layer. In the reticular layer, we have dense irregular connective tissue that are bun bundles of collagen fibers that, um, uh, that have the, the papillary layer. There, there's those collagen fibers in the papillary layer, and they go into the, those of the reticular layer, and they mostly run parallel to each other. There are times when we have separations between those bundles that represent a tension line in the skin. And, and this happens when we have a lot of um, bending. So you'll see some dermal folds or flexure lines where you see a lot of bending in the skin. So take a minute and look at your elbow. If you look at your elbow, you will see that when you straighten your arm, you see lots of uh, wrinkles on the um, outside of your arm, the point of your elbow. And when you bend your arm, you'll see more, more um, wrinkles on the inside, and those uh, wrinkles uh, in your skin um, are, are tension lines, and that's where the, the collagen has broken in the dermis. The hypodermis is composed of areolar tissue um, containing adipose, blood, and lymphatic vessels, and some nerves. It does have a special touch receptor called the Pacinian corpuscle, which is very, very sensitive, or it's much more sensitive to pressure. So heavier pressure than we will find with the Meissner's corpuscle, which is found a little bit higher up in the uh, epidermis, um, we have the Pacinian corpuscle. The fibers of this hypodermis are continuous with those of the dermis. Um, what the hypodermal layer allows is it allows the skin to move freely over the underlying bone and muscle without putting tension on the skin. If you've ever had to restrain a cat for a procedure, you, you know what this hypodermis is capable of because this cat can practically turn its entire body, interior body around in its skin. And it's the hypodermis that allows that skin to move over the body that way. Some of the special features of the skin that we're gonna talk about are pigmentation, paw pads, the planum nasal, ergots and chestnuts. This is important in hooved animals, particularly in horses or equine. And then we're going to talk about cutaneous pouches in sheep, just because it's um, a, a lot different from other species. Pigmentation. 
is the result or of the presence or absence of melanin granules in the extensions of the melanocyte. So if you look at this funny picture here, this is a cell and it has projections coming up off of it. These projections are facing typically toward the outside of the body. What is going on is that as a pre-melanosome is made from, from around the nucleus, and as it goes up towards the projections, it will get darker and darker. And the more dark melanocytes that are up in these projections, the darker the skin. There are two types of melan melanin granules found in um, dogs, but only one type found in horses. Um, the dogs is a eumelanosome and the pheomelanosome. You can see that they're slightly different shades. So, the, these are granules that move up to the projections um, to the outside of the melanocyte. The more that are there, the more pigmentation you can actually see with your eyes. They're macroscopically present. Melanocyte stimulating hormone is what controls the dispersion of granules. And keratocytes will arrange melanin on the side of the cell with the greatest amount of sun exposure. What this does is it protects the keratocytes from exposure to damaging ultraviolet rays. If you think about this, you will understand that genetically through time, we see darker skins in warmer climes and we see lighter skins in cooler climes. And that is a protective mechanism that the skin has in order to protect itself and protect um, the being within that skin from damage from UV rays. Paw pads are thick layers of fat and connective tissue with exocrine sweat glands and lamellar corpuscles. This is important to remember because dogs and cats, well, primarily dogs, don't have a, a way to um, sweat um, throughout their skin. So the only place they do sweat is in their paw pads. If you've ever seen a dog um, on a hot day walk across a smooth surface and you see the, the paw prints, but he hasn't walked through water, that's because he's sweating. And, and that's what you're seeing is the sweat on the, on the bottom of the, paw, of the paws. Um, that outer surface is the thickest and toughest skin of the body. It's often pigmented and it's composed of all five epidermal layers. Now take a minute. I want you to think through the five epidermal layers. Going from the inside to the outside, we have the stratum basal, we have the stratum spinosum, we have the stratum granulosum, the stratum lucidum, and the stratum corneum. So the co stratum corneum, remember, is 20 to 30 layers of keratinized cells or ker ker uh, keratinocyte remnants, and it is thicker than all of those other layers combined. There are also little conical papillae that can be seen covering the entire pad. Now this conical papilla is just a little projection that stands up like a little finger. Um, and if you look very closely on the pad, paw pad, you can see little dots. And those are the conical papillae. You will also see these little conical papillae on the top of the nose. Um, so if you're, you have a dog or cat in front of you, take a look. Take a look and, and see if you can see that conical papillae. The reason that we bring this up is that there are diseases that will cause that conical papilla to disappear. And it's important to understand that, that those are normal and we want to look for those in a normal animal. So the planum nasal is what we call the top of the nose in cats, pigs, sheep, and dogs. It's called the planum nasolabial in the muzzle of cows and horses. And the reason for that is that the muzzle of cows and horses and their nose the nose and the lips aren't really differentiated. It's all part of the same structure. Usually the planum nasal is pigmented and it is typically aglandular, meaning it doesn't have any glands that produce a substance except in sheep, pigs, and cows. So sheep, pigs, and cows have glands in their nose, on the outside of their nose. The planum nasal is composed only of three epidermal layers. That's the stratum ger germinatum which is the stratum basal, the stratum spinosum, and the stratum corneum. What's not present, of course, is the stratum lucidum and the stratum granulosum. Here is a picture of a nose that should have conical papillae on it. Now, if you look closely, you will see that there is some on the outside of this nose. But on the inside, we have a damaged planum nasal, 
that is smooth. It should not look like that. So if you know what normal looks like, it's easier to see what abnormal looks like. Ergots and chestnuts. These are dark horny structures found on the legs of horses and ponies and other members of the equine family. They're thought to be vestiges of carpal and tarsal pads. Carpal means the wrist, tarsal means the ankle. Um, and in a horse, the wrist is here and the ankle is here. And uh, of the, it's the pads of those second and fourth digits, the splint bones that are not touching the ground. Now, let me explain this to you in a way that makes it a little easier to understand. What I want you to do is I want, to take, I want you to take your hands and put them on your desk or on the floor. Take away your thumb, put it behind your hand. Horses don't have thumbs. Neither do um, any of the animals that we deal with except for primates. So take your thumb and put it behind. Okay, they don't have that. Take your sec, uh, your um, also your pinky and put it behind, wrap it around your thumb. Now you should only have three fingers down. Now what I want you to do is bend your second and fourth finger and keep your third one down on the floor or on your desk. If you look at your second and fourth finger bent, those are the splint bones of the horse. The third digit is the only one hitting the ground and the second and fourth digits are uh, on either side. They're not hitting the ground, but that's where the ergots are. The base of those is the pads where the uh, ergots would be. So the base of the splint bones that come down, but not all the way to the ground, right? So that's what you're looking at. And the, um, uh, the, the chestnuts are where the thumb would be. So if you want to think of it that way. Cutaneous pouches and sheep, they're a little bit different. Um, we don't see this in any other species. They are infoldings of skin at the infraorbital, which means below the eye, interdigital, which means between the claws or between the digits that, that uh, are touching the ground, and inguinal pouches. Inguinal is in the area inside between um, the rear limbs up on the abdomen just a little bit. These cutaneous pouches, skin pouches, contain fine hairs and numerous sebaceous and oil glands. Why is this important? It's because they secrete a fatty yellow substance which covers and sticks to the skin when it's dry. Have you, if you've ever felt a sheep or have felt a wool that has come off a sheep, you will feel a greasy feeling on your fingers. That greasy feeling is this um, product of the cutaneous pouches. That greasy feeling is something that we bottle up and we call it lanolin. Lanolin is often added to skin protectants. Um, it is something that is sold as lanolin as well, and it helps to protect skin. So it's a waxy substance that we get from sheep that we can use on our own skin to help moisturize and protect our own skin. Let's talk about hair. Um, hair strands and follicles, how does hair grow? Different types of hair. We talk about the glands of the skin, um, sebaceous glands and sweat glands, tail glands and anal sacs, um, claws, dew claws, hooves, and horns. So hair is, um, the function of it is to maintain body temperature and to provide camouflage. We have three different parts. Well, there's actually five different parts, but um, three that we uh, typically will see is the hair shaft, which is visible above the skin. Uh, if you pull the hair out, you have the hair root that is buried within the skin. The hair root is attached um, into the hair follicle where, the, where it is anchored to the uh, deepest part of the hair follicle, which is a hair bulb. I'm going to show you a picture of that in just a second. At the base of that hair bulb is a little mound of dermal cells called the papilla. Another little mound of cells or finger projection called a papilla. Um, that, those dermal cells are where the epithelial cells um, start uh, their process of maturing, filling with keratin, and moving away from that papilla. We have root sheath layers. They're connective tissue root sheath. Um, an external root sheath and an internal root sheath. Um, each hair uh, strand is organized into three layers. We have the cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla. Anytime we talk about cortex and medulla in any of the structures we're talking about in anatomy and physiology, 
physiology, you remember that the cortex is on the outside and the medulla is on the inside. The cuticle is the covering around both of those. We have a root hair plexus, which is a web of sensory nerve endings or a touch receptor at the, uh, the base of that root hair. The growth cycles of hair. We have three phases. Anagen is when cells are added at the base of the root and hair lengthens. So anagen means the hair is getting longer. The catagen phase is when we have a period of transition between anagen and telogen. So that's easy, that's right in between. The telogen phase is when we have a maximum length of hair that's achieved. The hair is stopping growing, the hair follicle shortens, and the hair is held in a resting phase. And then it's going to fall out and we're going to have uh, people calling us and we're going to have them asking, why is my dog shedding so much? And you can say, well, we just finished up with the telogen phase. Don't worry, we're getting to the antigen phase next and you will get more hair added to it. It's also important to remember these phases because a lot of times these phases are related to season or the light, um, the length, the day length. And there are times of the year where hair will grow faster. So if you shave an animal for surgery in the winter, fall or winter, and the hair is no, not growing back very quickly, part of that could be that there is a growth cycle um, in the hair and uh, you're not getting um, uh, hair growth at that time. But it will come back, should come back, no problem. Hair color. How do animals get different colored hair? Well, remember those melanocytes. Those melanocytes transfer melanin to the cortical and medullary cells that form the hair strand. How do we know what color is going to, what color the animal is going to be? It depends on the, on the genetic process. There are different colors that are, that are resulting from the quantity and type of the melanin incorporated in the hair. Horses produce one type of melanin, dogs produce two. If you remember back to that slide, we had the melanocyte with the projections. I said that dogs have eumelanosomes uh, and pheomelanosomes. Um, horses only have uh, eumelanosomes. Um, as animals age, melanin production, melanin production decreases and the ha hair is going to be turning gray. White hair is formed when the cortex completely loses its pigment and the medulla com becomes completely filled with air. Did you know that polar bears have clear hair? They have black skin and clear hair. And the result of the reflection of the light gives us a white color uh, to that hair. There are also different types of hair. There are primary or guard hairs. Primary or guard hairs are straight or arched. They are typically thicker and longer than secondary hairs. Secondary or wool type hairs are softer and shorter than primary hairs. They can be wavy or bristled in the dog. The pre it's the predominant hair type in species or breeds with wool type coats. When we think of breeds of dogs that have wool type hairs versus uh, primary, uh, primary, more primary hairs, um, we think of poodles. We think of Bichon Frises. These are Lhasa Apsa Shih Tzus. These are animals that need to be groomed. They actually have, this, they have hair. Other dogs have fur. Other breeds have fur. Fur grows to a certain length and stops and it sheds and then grows again. With hair type dogs, dogs that are quote unquote hypoallergenic, their hair will grow and it will grow and it will grow. These are the dogs that need to be groomed, um, clipped regularly in order to maintain a healthy hair coat. They can't maintain a healthy hair coat if they're not regularly groomed. And a healthy hair coat means healthy skin as well. So it's important to remember that the difference between a furred animal and a, and a wool or a ha um, haired animal. There are also, within those types of hair, within that hair altogether, we have our tactile or sinus hairs. These contain numerous sensory endings. They're commonly known as whiskers, and they're also mixed intermittently throughout the hair coat. They're also called a sinus hair um, because there's a large blood sinus, that blood that feeds the nerve, is, the nerve um, right underneath that whisker, um, and it's located in the connective tissue portion of that follicle. Okay, remember I said that there was a muscle uh, in, it's a, it's a smooth muscle actually, that's within the skin, in the dermis. Um, that's called the erector pili muscle. Um, 
it is smooth muscle, it's not skeletal muscle. It's attached to each hair follicle. And um, it's when it's used, it pulls the hair to an erect position when it's contracted. Um, and it is. Um, it also helps to um, open up the duct um, and secrete any um, sebaceous uh, secretions um, that, uh, that the gland would have produced. Uh, so we have an erector pili muscle. The other thing to, to remember as we go through our systems is that this is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. I'm going to go over this again and again and again because the first time you're going to hear it, sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. So think about the erector pili muscle pulling up the hair, making it erect. What do you do? What do you see when an animal is scared? Their hair goes up, right? It makes them look bigger. Um, their hackles are raised if it's a dog, or they become, have big bushy tails if it's a cat. Um, that's the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, raising or uh, contracting that muscle, innervating that muscle, contracting it, and raising the hair up. It's all connected. All right, let's talk about the glands of the skin. Sebaceous glands, sweat glands, which are also called sudoriferous glands, the, um, and there are um, two different sweat glands, the eccrine and the apocrine sweat glands, and then we have the tail glands and the anal sacs, which I know you're excited to get to. All right, sebaceous glands, they're located in the dermis, and they can be simple or complex alveolar structures. Alveolar means a sac-like structure. Most of these have a single duct that empties into a hair follicle, while others may have ducts that empty directly onto the surface of the skin. Epithelial cells lining the sebaceous gland manufacture and store sebum. So this, this uh, sebum is a waxy feeling substance, oily waxy substance um, that will then be uh, spread throughout the skin and helps to protect the skin, waterproof the skin and to protect the skin against um, attack from allergens and bacteria, et cetera. Because the epithelial cell is lost when, during the process of secretion, the sebaceous gland is classified as a holocrine structure or hollow structure. It doesn't have cells in it. Sebum, so this is uh, what is in that. It's composed of glycerides, glycerides and free fatty acids. It's kind of a, a waxy, um, oily substance. The erector pili muscle that we talked about before, it contracts and compresses the sebaceous gland and forces sebum through the duct onto the hair follicle, which coats the base of the hair and the surrounding skin. This is what helps to trap moisture, keeps the hair soft, pliant, and somewhat waterproof. Um, it also reduces the skin's risk of infection and allergens. Um, if allergens can't get in and create an allergic reaction, then you don't have an allergic reaction. Sweat glands are also called sudoriferous glands. They're found over the entire body of most domestic species, but not dogs and not pigs. Important to remember that. Sweat helps to cool the body through evaporation. You should know this um, from your own body. Uh, we sweat when it's hot. And the reason we do that is that it releases uh, water onto our skin, which then cools our skin by evaporation. There are two types of sweat glands. They are the eccrine and apocrine sweat glands, and it's real easy to tell them apart. Eccrine sweat, sweat glands um, are em empty onto the surface of the skin, and apocrine sweat glands empty into hair follicles. So eccrine, surface of the skin, apocrine into the hair follicles. A lot of animals also have tail glands. These, this, it's a, kind of an oval region at the dorsal base of the tail, so on top of the tail, near the rump, um, not too far from the rump, and dogs and cats. Um, it has coarse, oily hairs and very large apocrine and sebaceous glands. Now, they're so large that you can actually see the openings. They almost look like blackheads. Um, it's thought to assist in uh, recognition and identification of individual animals, so it carries the animal's own scent. Okay, so sniffing the tail of another animal is one way to get to know them a little bit better. I'm not suggesting that you do it. I'm just saying that's what animals do. Um, if you are fortunate to be in the class with me, uh, at some point when Private has been recently shaved, I will show you that on his tail. If you've never seen this, if you find a tomcat, it's very easy to see on a tomcat uh, tail. It may be related, um, the, the, the um, activity of it may be more related to hormone release within the body. Um, 
uh, and we're talking sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen, because I definitely see it more in animals that have been intact for some time. Anal sacs, I know we're all excited to talk about this. Um, if you didn't know this, cats and dogs have anal sacs similar to musk glands of skunks. It smells almost as bad, not quite, but almost as bad. Uh, they are located at the five and seven o'clock positions relative to the anus, and this picture um, depicts it. Obviously, skin covers over top of those anal sacs. You don't see them from the outside. They're connected to the lateral margin of the anus by a single small duct. And this can create a problem later on if we get anal sacs that are full of material that is too thick to go through that duct, or if that duct has any swelling around it, any skin swelling around it, that will block that duct. Um, the anal glands are, are lined with sebaceous and apocrine glands. Remember, sebaceous glands are holocrine gl glands, and we also have apocrine glands as well. Why do they have these anal sacs? Well, it's another way of promoting their own territory with their own smell. They are supposed to express them when they defecate. If they have a normal bowel movement, um, as the, um, the feces moves through the anus, it should put pressure on those anal sacs and those anal sacs should cover the bowel movement with the animal's scent. Doesn't always happen. Occasionally, it will they will express them uh, when they become frightened, when they tighten the muscles around their anus, um, that also will express the anal glands. Claws and dew claws. Claws are the outer coverings of the distal digits and they're usually pigmented. Um, they function in maintaining traction and serve as tools for defense and catching prey. Claws are non-retractable except in most cat species. Dew claws are the evolutionary remnants of digits. In dogs, the dew claw is the first digit or the thumb. If you look at your, your hand and you look at your thumb, um, and you look at your dog or your cat's um, uh, front digits usually, or front uh, paws usually, they will have a dew claw um, on just a little bit higher up than the rest of their pad, uh, paw pad. Um, on cow, pig, sheep, um, they do have medial and lateral dew claws. Um, again, if you put your hand down on, the, on your desk or the floor, you take away your thumb, and you put your second and third digits down, or your third and fourth digits down, and bend your second and fifth digits, you have what looks like a pig, goat, sheep, um, cow, uh, claw, or, or hoof. The hoof is very important. Um, it's the horny outer covering of the digits of some animals. Um, another name for hoof is ungula. So if you hear or see the term ungulate, that just means it's a hooved animal. Hooves rest on tissue. So the nail part, that hard covering, rests on a tissue called the corium. If you were to pull your nail off your finger, I do not recommend it, but if you did, you would see a similar tissue called, um, called the corium. It's, on the, the, it's the bed under, on which your nail rests. That corium is attached to the periosteum of the distal phalanx. So the distal phalanx is the very tip of the digit. So if you are a horse and you walk on your third digit, um, the very tip of that third digit, there's a bone um, that you, you can see the last joint, there's that final bone, that's where the horn, the uh, corium is attached to the, the bone or the periosteum, the outer covering of the bone, and to the hoof. The outer hoof is a modified epithelial layer and the corium is a modified dermis. So we have layers of the skin, epidermis, dermis, and then we have um, the, the, the dermis attached directly to the periosteum. The skeletal foot of the horse includes the distal part of the second phalanx and the distal sesamoid bone uh, or navicular bone and the entire third phalanx. So if we look here on the skeleton, this is the middle phalanx, okay, or second phalanx or P2, um, and this is the, the uh, third phalanx or third part, and here is the navicular bone or the sesamoid. Okay? And again, this would be the third digit on your hand that we're looking at. This is also called the coffin bone. The coffin bone is that last tip, okay? 
And if anything happens to that coffin bone, the reason it's called a coffin bone, anything happens to that, that horse is gonna be in a coffin. There's not much we can do. Um, and there's a lot that can go wrong here. What happens is that there is the hoof and the corium um, bind together much like the epidermis and the dermis do. Remember those papillae or the, the, the locking mechanism, the Lego mechanism that we talked about? And that's called lamini in this area. So anything that causes the inflammation or the infection or damage to that lamina, we call that laminitis. And uh, that is, uh, can be deadly in a horse. Um, the equine hoof, if you look at it, uh, it's generally divided into three parts. We have the wall of the hoof, which is the outer portion, the sole, which is underneath, and the frog, which is the inner portion. We'll talk about that um, in more detail. The wall is that external portion of the hoof that's visible from the anterior lateral and medial views. And if you look back at the previous slide, you will see the toe, the quarter, and the heel. Okay, there are three parts. The sole is the pl plantar or palmar. We talked about those words before, plantar on the rear feet, palmar on the front feet. It's the surface of the hoof, the undersurface of the hoof, and the outer layers of that are avascular and lack inner innervation. So you can knock on that sole and they don't feel it. They'll feel the, the vibration, but they won't feel you pushing on that sole unless you push really, really hard. The frog is a triangular horny structure located between the heels on the underside of the hoof. It's not hard though. It has a digital cushion, a thick pad of fat and fibrous tissue that lies right beneath that sensitive um, frog. It's divided by a central depression known as the central sulcus. Let me show you that on the picture. Here is your central sulcus and it may go all the way up. Um, it is important to pay attention to the frog because it is sensitive. And so we do have to um, make sure that that sensitive frog, which tells them where their feet are, um, it maintains a healthy existence. There are lateral cartilages that extend proximally from the distal phalanx um, to hold the, um, the hoof in place as well. So we have the lamina and then the lateral cartilage. We'll talk more about the hoof when we talk about laminitis, but if you have a general idea of how it is attached to the body, you have a really good idea of what could go wrong. With the horns, these are also epidermal in origin. <clears throat> They're structurally similar to hair because they are composed of keratin. In adults, the horn is hollow and communicates directly with the frontal sinus. The frontal sinus is part of the skull and it's a, it's a uh, structure, a hollow structure within the skull um, usually full of air, sometimes full of a little bit of fluid. Um, it's important to remember that it communicates with the frontal sinus because if you're dehorning an animal and you get too close, you can open up that frontal sinus and you can have a problem uh, with infection, a sinus infection. There is a corium that lies at the root of the horn. It's bound to the horn process by the periosteum. Remember, it was the same corium with a lamina um, between the epidermis and the dermis. The uh, body of the horn is composed of tightly packed tubules, so it, it's a lot of air going through there. And we have uh, the wall of the horn uh, that is thinner at the base than at the apex. And at the base, that's where we do our dehorning, uh, so that's uh, where the, the wall is, is thinner. It makes it a little bit easier for us to dehorn that animal. That's all that I have for you today. Um, I want you to go back through this and tell me if you have any questions and we're going to talk about it some more when we get into class.